Hello everyone and welcome to the deck guide for Evolve Shaman. I got to number one legend earlier this week with this deck with a 64% win rate overall this season playing pretty much exclusively within top 10 legend. Just looking at the stats here we have actually a positive win rate against every class in the game that exists. I didn't actually play against any majors. If you want to see some of the games, I, I stream daily Monday to Friday on twitch.tv slash so check me out there. Okay, let's talk about the card choices and why each card is in the deck, as well as like a general overview of what the game plan of the deck is. Okay, so basically the deck is mainly revolved around box by knuckles. Uh, I did just say revolve, right? Yeah, don't play this card, guys. This is a bad card. We'll get to that in a bit. Okay, individual cards. Lining Bloom. This is just, just a card basically to accelerate some of your swing turns. Turn 3, you can Bloom the weapon and have it equipped. Set up a swing turn 4, turn 5. Or you could, you know, Bloom out a coaster earlier. Or you could save the Bloom till your swing turn and maybe it enables a Sea Giant to come down where it wouldn't otherwise be possible. Broomstick. Very, very good card for once you've swung the weapon. You can go... Knuckles on 5, Desert Hair, Evolve, and then Broomstick. You're probably going to wipe the opponent's board, be very far ahead, value trade everything, and probably win the game from there. Sludge Slurper. This is a 1-drop that creates another 1-drop. I will say, for this card, you've got to be careful. It's not really a great turn 1 play outside of going first. It's not a card you want to be keeping in the mulligan very often. But I think it's a card that people naturally keep because, you know, it's the mulligan, we should keep 1-drops in the mulligan. But for this deck, it's a bit different. The power of this card is the fact that it's a 1-drop that creates another high-tempo 1-drop. When it comes to Mogus and Sea Giants in your swing turns, basically for every Mogu you have or Sea Giant you have, it's going to discount the mana on this by 1. So if you only have 1 Mogu, this is essentially 0 mana 1-drop. But if you have 2 Mogus in hand, Flood Surfer is suddenly minus 1 mana, and, and the 1-drop it makes is also minus 1 mana. Tour Guide is a similar story, but it actually is even more efficient in terms of discounting Mogus and Sea Giants because it's 1 mana for 2 minions instead of 2 mana for 2 minions. A little less value than the Sludge Slurper, but still very strong in the right circumstances. Custodian is uh, just broken broken turn 2 drop, finds your weapon. Uh, Evil Cable Rat, similar to Sludge Slurper, since like, the game plan of this deck is usually to not push for a board lead until turn 5 or so. In the early game, you're really just like toming a lot of times or just, you know, not affecting board. You don't really want to trade away your opponent's minions because if your opponent has minions on the board, it's going to make your swing turns better because you can get Mogus and Sea Giants down. So you don't really want early game that's going to trade one for one for your opponent that often. The nice thing about Cable Rat is it doesn't do that, but it also adds a high tempo one drop to your hand, which, like we discussed, is very important for the swing turns later. Also, try and two clackers. Now, I've only tried this card for one day. It felt pretty okay. It's a bit of redundancy for Evolve effects. Like, sometimes you have games where you just hit, you know, your Desert Hairs, your, your Coasters, your Mogus and stuff, but you don't actually hit the weapon itself. It doesn't happen that often, but it sometimes happens. Or sometimes you're very limited in how many weapon swings you have, but you want to have, like, just one Evolve effect. Bogstock clackers are a nice way of doing that. It also improves Tour Guide as a turn 1 play. If you're going first and you have Tour Guide Clacker, it's actually a pretty good curve. I'm not sure whether you want 2 Rats or 2 Clackers. This is still up for debate. I want to see a bit more data on that before I decide. For now, we've got it this way around. It could possibly be the case that the other way around is better and you want 2 Cable Rats. Desert Hair, OP Evolve card. Really great synergy with the Knuckles. Fireheart is just like a really good late game card. You can also use it just to find answers or lethal or what have you. And like the, the floor on this card, it really isn't too bad. 3 mana, 3 free, discover a spell. That's better than a Volpera Scoundrel. Hitmaster, this is basically a weaker Desert Hair. If we could run 4 Desert Hairs, we absolutely would. But we can't, so this is the next best replacement. It is slightly better on turn 3, and sometimes that is a play that you want to be making. But not very often, most of the time. You're going to be wanting to corrupt this and just use it as a weaker desert hair. Dreadcore said this is one of the um, driving factors of why Boxbine Knuckles is such a high tempo card. If you were to play Boxbine Knuckles without Dreadcore there, you're basically playing a 5 mana Truza Silver Champion on the same player. But with a Dreadcore there, you're going to regain a lot of tempo by having a 0 mana 5 drop. 
is actually often, even if you have Dread Corsair and Bog Spine Knuckles in hand, it's often correct not to swing, or sometimes even to swing but not develop the Dread Corsair when you play the weapon initially. Basically because you get an extra minion for Derailed Coaster, your opponent's not allowed to trade off any of their minions onto the board. Say, say you uh, swung and Dread Corsair the turn you equip the weapon, your opponent has some minions left, they're just going to trade into your 5 drop, and that means it's going to be very hard to get Mogul or Sea Giant down. Old Purge, uh, this card, I don't think it was very good before the introduction of Cage Match Custodian in Evolve Shaman because you just didn't get the weapon as frequently as you do now. But now that you get it, Horde Purge is an excellent tool. It's a very, very high value card. Very good in slower matchups. Often in a, in a faster matchup, you don't really need a second weapon to win. But if you're against like a warrior or a priest, Horde Purge has a lot of value. Uh, Knuckles, we talked about that, yeah, Driving Force of the deck, not much to say other than very, very strong card. Uh, Coaster, Mogu, and Sea Giant, these are build-around cards. The deck, while it's also built around the Knuckles, it's also built with these three cards in mind. And when you're playing the game also, you want to be keeping Coaster in mind, for sure. You need to consider whether you want to be actually playing minions from hand. Because basically, every time you lose a minion hand, say you played a tour guide earlier, it's also going to take away a rush from the turn that you play the coaster. So managing that is very important. When it comes to Mogu and Sea Giant, you also want to be managing whether or not you want to be clearing your opponent's board. Sometimes it's not going to be possible, but if your opponent's got, say, like a 1-1 one, one or a 1-3, a minion that's very unlikely to be killing you anytime soon, it's often better to leave it alive and not offer it any trades to be able to trade off. We'll get into specific examples of gameplay footage so you can see these situations a little bit easier. But for now, we just wanted to give an overview of the deck. Now really, there are two ways to build Evolve Shaman. One is to go for the Coaster Sea Giant route, maximize those cards as much as possible, which is the one that I prefer. I feel like it's a bit stronger. Also, it's way more fun because you just have these explosive turns that you just don't get in other versions. Another way is to build it more just like an aggressive deck. This version is viable, it is probably a bit easier to play than the coaster version, and it is certainly still strong. You're seeing different cards like Surge and Tempest, Three Mana Spells, Serpent Shrine Portal, and Storm Strike, and as well as Faceless Corruptor. These cards are like all fine, but they don't work very well in the Sea Giant version simply because you're not really trying to get ahead on belt board early on. You don't want to have as many spells because they hurt your coaster. As well as these two cards being spells, they're both removal spells. This isn't something you want to be doing to your opponent's board in the early game. You want to be keeping the board tension high so the Mogus and Sea Giants comes down easier. If you're just spending cards to remove the opponent's board, it's going to be very hard to get those big, big swing turns. What's more is that Serpent Shrine Portal overloads you for one, so it's a bit awkward to play on turn 3, particularly if you're on the coin, since normally you want to be doing a play like Coin, Bog Spine, Knuckles. Also a problem with Faceless Corruptor in the Coaster version is that you're not usually ahead on board, so it's hard to have a target unless you've played a Tour Guide. And outside of that, you just have better plays that you want to be doing in the form of coaster turns, red wide turns, plus Mogu slash Sea Giant. It is a decent card in this version since, you know, it's pretty good for evolving. You get two five drops, you can value trade them before evolving as well. But in the other version, which we are playing, there's just other things you want to be doing with your mana around turn five. And Faceless Corruptor is just too far down the list to warrant an inclusion in the deck. I will say, if you're having trouble with swing turns, this version of the deck is probably quite a bit easier to pilot, um, and it's still very strong. Okay, so one of the questions I get asked a lot when I stream this deck is, why aren't you running Revolve? And the simple answer to that is it's not a very good card. If you take a look at pretty much any deck that runs Revolve, the drawn win rate is pretty much near the bottom every time. Same for Mulligan win rate, it's fairly low down. Give you another example. Yeah, not looking great. Uh, outside of that, we, I can explain why it's bad as well. Basically, the, you draw the weapon so consistently that you don't really need this effect, and it's only particularly good on other uh, evolved effects. It's not really that great. It's, if you played it on a Pitmaster, it's really probably degrading your board a lot of the time since the 2-man 3-2s are towards the top end of stats. Sometimes it has use against like a Rogue or Aggro Demon Hunter since they tend to buff up their minions. Quite a lot, okay, Edwin or buffed up Battle Fiends, for example. Sometimes it's good for a, a devolve effect, but in terms of being a proactive player, it's not a great 
not good at getting through taunts and things since when you revolve your board, you can't get to attack with your minions again afterwards. And it's not good at correcting bad evolves for you. Typically, you'll go very, very wide when you do an evolve turn. So you're going to maybe get some bad ones, but you're also probably going to get some good ones. And when you revolve it, it's probably going to be a similar story where you'll have some good ones and some some bad ones. What's more is it's not a minion, which is a big deal with the coaster deck, and it's a big deal in grindy matchups. Sometimes you have a weapon, but you lack board generators. If you have to have a revolve in hand, it's probably just been a dead card for a long time. Revolve does nothing to develop your board. Just as a side note, I used to run a previous version of this deck, which you may or may not have run into on ladder at some point, which includes some totem package cards, totem reflection, evil totem, and Manatide Totem basically made this deck at a time when all I was facing in top legend was really warriors for the most part and I just needed a little bit extra value and I thought Totem stuff was good. Also I really liked Tour Guide as a card but it, I felt like it wasn't pulling its weight because it's quite low value against warrior but the Totemic Reflection boosts that card as well. Ultimately this version of the deck probably a bit better in like grindier matchups but it's much 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 weaker against aggressive decks and there is a lot of aggro demon hunter out there so if you run a list like this you're probably going to do pretty poorly against them but i wouldn't recommend this version of the deck if you're wondering about card replacements the deck overall is fairly cheap we're only running one legendary and four epics i believe but if you do not have some of the cards you can replace them. The main one that we got asked about is Instructor Fireheart. If you don't have this card, simply just run two Cable Rats and you'll probably be fine. It absolutely is not core to the deck. It's just a fine card, high value card that deserves a spot, but the deck plays absolutely fine without it. If you don't have Sea Giants, however, I would recommend you run a different version of Evolve Shaman, which isn't running the coaster that we just talked about. Okay, let's talk about Mulligans. Now there has been a little bit of data, 750 games since I tweeted out the list after hitting number one. So we have some data on HS Replay of people playing the deck in Legend rank. Now I wouldn't trust this Mulligan win rate data particularly too much, but I want to give my thoughts on what cards you should be keeping and general trends we're seeing here, which I think maybe are wrong. If you are completely new to Evolve Shaman, um, you want to probably stick to the basics. Custodian, Box by Knuckles, you just want to have the weapon in every single game that you play. People, if they're newer to the deck, might be thinking, I don't want to keep the Knuckles itself because if I hit Custodian, the Custodian's not going to draw a card. But the most important thing is that you hit the weapon. So, as a general rule, always keep Knuckles, always keep Custodian. If you have both Custodian and Knuckles, you can throw away the Knuckles and just keep the Custodian. Now, there are some specific matchups where the weapon isn't your win condition, uh, generally very aggro decks, but we'll get to discussing that when we go to the specific matchup guide. Just from looking at the data we have on the HS Replay here, I think people are misplaying the Mulligan a lot. You see the we can organize by cap percentage here, and you can see that the one drops outside of the weapon stuff are the highest kept cards. Now, I don't blame people for doing this because pretty much in most deck in Hearthstone, you want to have your turn 1 plays on turn 1. So, you know, it's just Hearthstone basics. The difference is with this deck is that they're not great early game cards. They're not really going to get you ahead on board against most decks. They're, they're fine against decks that don't really play enough early game to contest board. Say you're like against a Warrior, for instance. You know, Sludge Slurper having this high percent keep is probably fine since... The warrior doesn't really play anything contested too early on in the game. But for the most part, these cards aren't really your win condition. A win condition for most matchups is going to be the weapon plus your swing turn. You should only really be keeping these cards if you're going first and you have like a clacker, I would say. Like tour guide into clacker going first. Pretty good opening hand that actually might get your head on board. Five slight slurper, also the same. If you're against like a slow deck, also can do that. But like, if you're against like a druid or something, even if you get these one drops on board, they're not going to be winning you the game. What's going to win you the game is the weapon. So if you don't have the weapon, but you have a one drop in hand, just throw away the one drop and just have a higher chance of finding the weapon. If you already have the weapon in your mulligan, then you need to consider keeping complementary cards alongside it. That means things like Dread Corsair is always a keep when you have the weapon. Things like Desert Hair become good as well. And Coaster also, Mogu, Flesh Shaper also 
pretty good once you have the weapon already. If you already have like a really good hand, like you have weapon desert, maybe you can consider keeping broomstick as well, since it has synergy with both of those cards. I will say outside of the cap percentage for uh, Sludge Slurper and Tour Guide being way too high on here, you know, so is Cable Rat really, and Clacker, but it's only 20%, it's fine. But I will say that Mogu Flesh Shaper and Sea Giant's cap percentage are way too low for them to be playing correctly. Now you might say, like, if you're taught by Mulligan win rate, wait, Sea Giant, Mogu, they're right at the bottom, so is Broomstick, you're just advocating for keeping those cards some of the time. I was, but you only want to be keeping them in certain matchups and also with, in the context of certain hands. If you have a, a hand with Derailed Coaster, Mogu, Sea Giant in it, it's a very, very powerful hand. Turn 5, you like completely obliterate the board. As for keeping Lightning Bloom, it is kept half the time. I would say you only really need this card uh, in matchups where you need to be quicker, so pretty much any aggressive deck. It probably includes Rogue as well, since Rogue actually tends to win through early aggression. They cannot win in the late game. So if you have a Bloom, it's kind of okay against them. But I would only keep this card in aggro matchups or in other matchups if your hand's already good, like you have Odin already. You, you have like some synergy cards for the weapon. Then you can just speed up your game plan. If you have the weapon already against like a warrior, for instance, keeping Horde Purger makes a lot of sense since you, you need to play a long game and it's a lot of value once you already have the weapon. So always think when you're doing your mulligan to have a bit of context. Plan out your turns. For instance, you know, if you're going first and you have Sludge Sloper Custodian, maybe you don't need both since if you're playing Slurper on one, you can't play Custodian on two, so they don't have great synergy together. If you already have Tour Guide and Slurper, maybe you don't need them both since you already have a turn one play if you want to go down that route. Also keep in mind though, like, don't be afraid of big coaster hands as well. They are very powerful. You'd have like coaster, sea giant, sea giant for instance in the mulligan. You'd be like, why would I want to keep 5 mana and 10 mana cards? But they synergize so well together, it's going to give you a very powerful turn 5. Even more powerful, to be honest, if you have maybe one Mogu instead of a sea giant. So that kind of start is just like very powerful, even though it doesn't include the weapon. And then we can see late on here, get percent of Sea Giant and Mogu is way too low. Whereas Coaster also way too low. Even though you might be like, oh, jump break, Mogu, Sea Giant, Coaster, their mulligan win rate's pretty poor. It is, but I'm pretty sure people are just misplaying their mulligans with this deck. And maybe even their, their turns as well. If you want some care percentage on cards from me, uh, unfortunately on this data for me, I've been trying out a bunch of different cards, uh, different variants of the deck, so like nothing's all put together, but we can look at the largest sample size, which is this one, and just look at my cap percentage. Bodian 100%, Knuckles 90%, Desert Hair 85%, Maybe a little bit too high for Desert Air. Right, the Mulligan win rate is not as high as some of the stuff, but... Plus Surf is down to 50%, and Tall Guy is down to 30% on keeps. But you see Sea Giant, we've got a keep of 30%, we've got Mogu as a keep of 45%. This makes sense. I'm keeping Sea Giant in matchups where it's good, but it's not as easy to get down as a Mogu. Just because it costs one more mana. So like it's gonna have a lower cap percent because I'm really only keeping Sea Giant when I've got like insanely good hands with it, which has like poster plus the Mogu already. Broomstick also we've got a thirty six percent keep, and this is again just like a highly conditional keep. I'm only really keeping this when I already have something like Weapon plus Desert Hair. It becomes a good keep. But like you see, Tor is just very much lower down on the list than other stuff. This card's just really just a filler card. Um, like if you play it on turn one, it's really not that great for you. It maybe saves you a bit of life, but all your stuff still gets value traded into, to be honest. And you don't really gain that much. Like your totems die for free eventually. So as a general rule, if you're like not really sure, you know, full mulligan for weapon, and if you have the weapon, keep weapon accessories. Okay, let's talk about swing turns and why they are powerful. This deck runs a lot of ways to flood the board very, very quickly. 
play you can do is equip Orcspine Knuckles with a Dread Corsair in hand and not play the Dread Corsair. Very tempting to do so, you're going to get a 5 drop immediately, but if you hold it, it has some benefits. So you could just play the Dread Corsair at swing here, be ahead of 5 drop, but that's going to open up a lot of plays to your opponent. They can use any removal tools they have, they can trade their minions away uh, and remove your 5 drop and you'll be left with nothing, you'll have a hand. In this case with the Derail Coaster plus a Siege Iron in, this is not what you want to be doing. Basically, if you just equip a weapon, if they don't have weapon removal, the opponent is pretty much forced to develop board, or do nothing. And that is good for us since we have a sea giant. The more board they have, the cheaper the sea giant is, and the bigger the swing turn we, we will have. We're basically setting up here a turn 5 coaster. By not playing the dread also, we add another rush minion to the coaster. If we were to play the dread, we'd have one less minion in hand and the coaster's going to summon less. So generally speaking, when you want to be going for these swing turns, you want to avoid playing any minions. For one, it makes your coasters smaller, and for two, it allows your opponent to trade off some of their board, and that's going to mean that your Sea Giant or your Mogu may not be able to come down. Instead, if we keep the board tension very, very high until our swing turn, and then do everything on one turn, it's going to allow us to cheat some extra mana and give, you, give us that larger edge in the matchup. So because we hold the dread, we add an extra 1-1 one, one rush here, and because zero mana, it's going to allow us to get a sea giant down. And generally take as good trades as we want. The problem with like developing board early is that the opponent gets to dictate the trades. Since we have a load of rush things, we can just take all the away all the bad trades from our opponent and make it a lot harder for them to deal with the board. The problem with staggering your threats is one, you don't get the Sea Giants down, and two, you allow your opponent to also stagger their removal. If they have all the removal they need, they need to spend the mana on it, and if we do everything on one turn, they're going to be limited to what mana they have. Here, they only have five mana. If we had staggered, maybe they could have spent you know three mana on turn three, and then four mana on turn five, and basically have no problem removing our threats. The thing with this deck is it's very, very snowbally. If you can get ahead on tempo on board, your next board is going to be even better. So you're very limited by your life total and your mana. The key to being good at this deck is balancing between the two. How big of a swing turn do you need versus how much face damage can you take? Okay, I just briefly wanted to talk about Lightning Bloom and how to use it on the coin. Turn 3, it can be very tempting when you're the coin to bloom out the bog spine knuckles. It means you're going to overload on your turn 4. And then you have your full mana available in turn 5, including the coin. And it seems pretty clean, right? However, if all you need is a, a swing turn to win you the game, just one swing turn, it's actually better to not use the bloom and just totem on your turn 3, and then coin out the weapon on the next turn. You end up floating a mana on turn 3, but the difference is you end up in the same board state, you've done the same actions, you've equipped weapon one turn and you've totemed on the other turn. But the difference is you have a lightning bloom in hand instead of a coin on your turn 5. It means you just have one extra mana available to make your swing turn that more impactful. It's not always incorrect to bloom out the weapon when you're on the coin however. Sometimes if you have desert hair in hand, a curve of bloom weapon into coin hair is very strong. Also if you have a hand with double dread corsair in it, going for bloom weapon double dread on turn 3 is very very powerful. Other times you might need to remove an opponent's minion immediately on turn 3, something like a buff Battle Fiend, or other high attack minions. Brings me to a little bit of a side note, sometimes you want to actually use your first swing on your weapon, just as removal, even if you have like Dread Corsairs in hand and not play them. That way you still get your big swing turn, but you're not taking as much damage every single turn, and your opponent's not going to have as threatening of a board once you've done your swing turn, if you don't have a bunch of rush guys to clean up their board as well. Okay, to summarize we have a bit of a checklist, number one, the most important thing, plan ahead for your turns. You need to know when your swing turn is, you need to know whether you want to be playing minions in the early game, you need to know when you want to be using your coin, typically you will be holding it for turn 5 in this deck, but it's not always the case. Sometimes it's later and rarely, sometimes it's earlier. You need to know whether you can afford to go for an absolutely huge swing turn where you set up the weapon, hold the dread, or if you're going to take too much face damage, be susceptible to weapon removal, be susceptible the big board clears later and you want to be getting in early damage, etc, etc. 
Number two, you want to keep the board tension high. That means avoid trading off weak minions from your opponent, or it means avoiding playing minions that allows your opponent to trade them off themselves. That's going to make your Sea Giants and Mogus get a lot more work done. Now, number three, if you want to set up a coaster turn, you want to be avoiding playing minions that don't replace themselves if your coaster is not already big enough. Fine to do so if you already have a huge amount of minions in hand. Could mean you play Cable Rat on turn three, but you don't play the Lackey just to enable the swing turn for the coaster. It could mean you already have a weapon in hand, but you have the potential to draw another through the 2 2, but you don't want to play it since it doesn't get your head on board and it also makes your coaster weaker. Same thing goes for Fireheart on turn 3. Just look out for these scenarios, it's not always the case, sometimes you just want to play them out. But it depends on, on how big your coaster is and whether you need it to be large or not. Number 4, decide what your spread wide minions are going to be for your swing turn. Now they could potentially be 1 drops, which is a huge deal. Sometimes it is not correct to play your 1 drops on turn 1 or turn 2, turn 3, even though if it fits your curve and it makes sense at the time, because you may have Sea Giants and Mogus in hand. And you know, typically early if you play them, it might take away from your coaster, it also might allow trades for your opponent. But there's going to be a lot of scenarios where you don't want to be playing them. When it comes to Tour Guide in particular, sometimes you can do a play where you play the first half of the Tour Guide, but you just hold the zero mana hero power, and that might help you for your swing turns in the future. Really for this point it just comes down to planning. If you have another way to spread wide that you're happy with playing, say it's a coaster or a desert hair, maybe you can get away with playing some one drops early. But sometimes it is going to be these one drops that are your spread wide cards. Number five, this is probably one of the most important things and it is actually just to count. Make sure that you have enough minions in hand for your coaster to be good enough to enable the Mogus and Sea Giants. Don't just guess, don't just play it and assume that they are playable. You're going to surprise yourself a lot of times when they're not. Just for ease of sake, um, if we assume we get a full board coaster, we need one board space to play each giant slash mogu. So you're typically going to be playing the coaster, trading off one dude, and then playing a giant. Great points for that. You have six minions on your on your side of the board. Giant costs ten, mogu costs nine. So to make mogu cost zero mana, your opponent needs three minions, and to make giant cost zero mana opponent needs four minions. So keep that in mind, it's a little bit of a shortcut. Number six, play Sea Giants before Mogus if they can't get cheaper. That means if your board is full. The reason to do this is because as you trade off some of your guys, potentially you're going to actually remove an opponent's minion from the board before you can get down all the Sea Giants and Mogus that you want. And in that scenario, sometimes if you sequence it right, you can play Sea Giant for zero, still do a trade, kill off your opponent's minion and the mogu is also still zero. If you do it in the other order with mogu first sometimes sea giant ends up costing mana and it becomes unplayable. Flip side to this is if you aren't limited by board space sometimes it's better to go mogu first. Say your mogus are costing zero mana but your sea giants are costing one. Well if you play the zero mana mogu first it's going to change the cost of your sea giant to zero as well and it's just a bit more efficient if you do it in that order. Brings me to number seven be careful on the sequencing of trades. Often you have to trade off some 1-1s to make board space for your Mogus and Sea Giants. But when you do this, make sure you're not actually killing off your opponent's minions in the process, because that's going to make the Mogus and Sea Giants more expensive. Sometimes this means doing a useless trade into, say, a minion that you're about to hit with your weapon, or a minion that your Mogus is about to value trade into, just so that you keep the number of minions in total on the board as high as possible. Uh, finally, number eight, if you want to use the broom, make sure you have one board space and also one mana left over. Things get a little bit complicated if you're also trying to get sea giants and things down on the same turn, but I'm sure you can figure it out. Let's talk about low rolls and high rolls for evolves and whether or not you should evolve one drops, because the big question I get asked all the time is, should we be playing around Doomsayer, or rather, people assume we should be playing around Doomsayer. Now there are 145 2 drops and only one Doomsayer. So the odds of hitting a Doomsayer, Doomsayer from any time you evolve a 1 cost card is 0.69%. But there are a bunch of beneficial you know, death rattles and things. Uh, we could just have a look here. And these are just death rattles alone. There's a bunch of other effects. The stats alone are worth it. These things like draw cards, add stuff to your hand, that sort of thing. 
So my typical rule for evolving one drops is if Doomsayer is the only way that you lose the game, you should not evolve a one drop. But for the vast majority of the time, you should absolutely be evolving your one drops because they are just better stats, better effects. There is an exception to this when it comes to toteming. Typically, you will want to totem first just to get that benefit in stats. But there will be scenarios where you just need a taunt to survive. And as we can see, it's 4.1% to evolve a taunt from evolving a one drop, which a totem is. But the taunt totem itself is a 25% chance of occurring. And if you just need one taunt to win the game, Sometimes a taunt totem is good enough against the likes of a, a demon hunter. Also worth noting whether you want to evolve the 1-1s one from Coaster. They are 1 mana minions, but you have the option to trade them on the, on the turn you play them. Typically, you just need to evaluate whether the trades are worth it, whether your life total is too low that you can't afford not to trade. The average stats for a 2-drop are about a 2-2, two, two, maybe a bit better. So... If you're trading two one ones into the opponent's one two, maybe you want to reconsider and just evolve those one ones instead. Also worth noting, the chance of evolving a taunt from each desert hair is about twelve percent. So the chance in total of evolving at least one taunt when you go for desert hair is about thirty-two percent. So it is higher than just rolling a taunt totem if you had to choose between them. As well as you know, you get the bonus stats. The highest chance for taunt in general is evolving to seven or eight. For around 20%. If you're playing Clacker, it's good to have a, a note of what the most likely chance for taunts are at what mana cost if you need it to survive. As a rule, the chance of taunt goes up with each mana cost peaking at 8 and then decreasing at 9 and decreasing further at 10. But generally, just evolve the highest cost minion. When it comes to playing around weapon removal, generally speaking, you need to have a good idea that they're actually running it. That means you have good meta knowledge or you've played the person before and you know they're running it. Beyond that, some ways to play around it is making sure you're ahead in tempo on the turn that you play your weapon. That can mean going for a swing turn without an evolve before you do so. Or if your opponent just simply doesn't have anything on board, you can just simply develop something like a desert hair and put them in an awkward spot. They either have to remove the hairs or you can just evolve them on the turn you swing the weapon. Same thing goes for Dredge Corsair. If, you, if you have a hunt they're running weapon removal it can be a good idea to develop dread corsair and swing on your first turn of equipping the fog spine knuckles that way if they do use some weapon removal at least you're going to be ahead on board the first example against the druid we were able to play around weapon removal because we're ahead on board basically in the second example against the priest we're going to be behind on board and we simply can't do a play where we just develop some stats and hope to evolve it next turn we have to go for a swing turn with a weapon and just hope the weapon removal is just not there. A lot of the time your hand and the board state is going to dictate whether you can play around it or not, and sometimes you just got to close your eyes and just hope they don't have it. Let's talk about resource management. Typically in most games, uh, especially the grindy games, you're going to either be limited by the number of weapon swings you have, or you're going to be limited by how many minions you have that can spread wide enough to generate another board for you. Sometimes you have games where you have both and you can just you know, play into every AoE you want to because you just have infinite refill. But most games you're going to either be limited by one way or the other, and that's going to dictate how you play the game. Obviously, if you're limited by weapon swings, you want to be a bit more conservative with them and make sure you get as much value as you can out of them. For instance, if you're already a little bit susceptible to AoEs or you're already pushing a bunch of damage, it might be a good idea not to add, say, a Desert Hair to the board if that's your refill. And instead just go for a totem plus like a one or a two drop instead. That way if the board clear does come down you can just refill with the desert hair and just have a threatening board once again. Also it's worth keeping in mind the quality of minions you're holding back. Often if you're developing something like Mogu while you already have a board against the warrior it's going to warrant them to want to clear it either through Brawl or, for Bar or through Barov. In those sorts of situations, maybe it's a good idea to hold back something like a Dread Corsair, since it is a 0 mana 5 drop on a refill. Even if you have like other board fillers like Pitmaster or Tour Guides and things like that, they're not going to be quite as threatening as a 5 drop. You see in the clip here, we play around Barov a little bit. We put out a threatening board that they get punished if they don't have a clear, forcing them to actually use one. But we held back a little bit of resources that way, our next board also has a lot of damage on it and is very threatening. 
Another form of resource management is choosing which spread wide minion you want to play on the turn you play it. Sometimes you'll be very tempted to just go immediately for Desert Hair since it's going to provide you the highest quality minions for the cost. But it's not always the case. Sometimes like it's your second swing of the weapon and you're approaching turn 7 and you have the choice between Coaster or Desert Hair. Now just because you have another weapon in hand doesn't mean you aren't limited by weapon swings. It costs mana to re-equip a weapon, so even when you have like Horde Purges or another weapon in hand, you might want to still be a bit conservative about swinging a weapon sometimes, particularly if you have expensive cards like Sea Giant or Mogu in hand, which cost a considerable chunk of mana on your turn if you want to make them playable. You really don't want to be spending a lot of mana on your turn re-equipping the weapon. Another play you can do if you're trying to play around board clears and you already have a decent amount of board is to just swing and re-equip the weapon ready for next turn. That way if a board clear does come down, you will have already spent the mana on equipping the weapon and then you can spend the next turn's full amount of mana just developing the board with minions. And, and then if the board clear does come down, you can spend the next turn's mana refilling the board with threats. Also when managing resources it's important to decide what spread wide minions you want to be playing. Something like a coaster board or a pit master may be weak to potential AoEs like Risky Skipper, Soul Demon Hunter's Mystic, or Priest Wild Pyromancer, where Desert Hair, Horde Pillagers, Dread Corsairs, and Mogus tend to be not as weak to them. Also, you need to consider your curve. If you have a weapon equipped on turn 6 and you have the choice between a Desert Hair and a coaster for your swing turn, sometimes you want to be going coaster first because you're about to play a bunch of minions and your future coaster is going to be worse in that case, even though it might make a weaker board initially. Also, you need to consider Horde Pillager as well. If you have Horde Pillager in hand ready for turn 7 to re-equip, that pairs really nicely with a 3 mana spread wide minion like a Desert Hair. So you might want to do a more expensive one on turn 6 and then just keep the Desert Hair in hand for refill. If you're against an aggro deck or just a pure tempo deck, it's going to be a lot less about managing overall swings and overall board generations and more about pure tempo. The main thing you want to be concerned about is making sure you have a weapon swing available when you need it and that might be the main reason you hold back, simply because you can't afford the mana to re-equip a weapon rather than the fact that you're limited by total amounts of swings that you have or total amounts of boards you can create. Overall what this comes down to is just planning, making sure you have good future turns as well as this turn being good. Don't overcommit on one turn, but also don't undercommit. A lot of times you can't just wait around forever. Also worth noting that if your opponent's board clears leave behind minions, sometimes it's wild pyromancer, sometimes it is risky skipper armorsmith stuff. It can be a good idea to hold back one of your reactive tools, something like a mogu or a coaster is quite good at answering skipper boards. Also when it comes to evolving, make sure your board is actually worth evolving. If you've hit a bunch of high rolls for the mana cost, sometimes it's better to just let that board ride for a while until your opponent decides to respond to it. That way you're not wasting a weapon swing on evolving good stated minions into average or potentially low stated minions on the next mana cost. Okay, that's the general overview for the deck. Well, let's talk about specific matchups. First off, Soul Demon Hunter. It used to be the most popular Demon Hunter deck until Aggro Demon Hunter came around, and now it is second fiddle to that in terms of popularity. In general, if you're facing a Demon Hunter and you don't know which type it is, I would recommend just mulliganing for the aggro Demon Hunter variant. The thing is with Soul Demon Hunter, if you have a bad hand, you have actually a bit of time bef before they kill you. If you're against aggro Demon Hunter and you have a bad hand, you simply just do not have the time to find the cards that you need. Also, aggro Demon Hunter is just more popular right now. In terms of mulligans against Demon Hunter, the, the mulligan guide on H3 Play is heavily skewed since aggro Demon Hunter is a very different mulligan strategy to Soul Demon Hunter. But if you know for a fact they are Soul Demon Hunter, you want to be looking for the weapon first and foremost. That's the card that's going to carry you to a victory. The main mistake that players are going to make against Soul Demon Hunter is staggering their threats. Soul Demon Hunter has access to two very excellent AoE cards. First one being Mystic, which requires them to have Soul Fragments, which are three mana and deals three to your board. And the second one is Blade Dance. Playing into Mystic isn't terrible, but playing into Mystic when you don't have refill and you've got a bunch of Mogu and Sea Giants in hand which you can't play because you played too early into Mystic, that can potentially lose you the game. But the, the main offender that people will fall into the trap of is Blade Dance. The worst thing you can do is go too early against them, say you just evolve some Desert Hairs and you haven't got any other board elsewhere. Well, you're gonna, only going to have three minions and the Blade Dance is going to be absolutely devastating to you. And the tempo that they gain of it 
particularly if they have a bladed lady as well, is probably going to win them the game. In my experience, the most effective way to beat Soul Demon Hunter is to go for a, a very, very large swing turn. One where you get some 10 drops down and you completely fill the board with minions. That way the Demon Hunter has a really hard time clearing up the board. Unless you massively low roll your evolves, you're going to have stuff that survives against the Mystic and you're going to be far too wide for Blade Dance to clear off your biggest threats. And even if they got super lucky and clear your biggest threats when they Blade Dance, they probably don't have the mana to use Mystic to clear the rest of your board as well. And you're probably going to snowball from there to a victory. Soul Demon Heart does play some early game cards. When they play these cards, it can be tempting to try to contest them, try to clear them early. You might be thinking, Soul Demon Heart does a lot of face damage if I'm taking the chip damage early from these 1-3s and 2-3s. Well, they're just going to kill me. And Soul Demon Heart does have a lot of base damage eventually, but it takes them quite a while to get it. Twin slices and weapons all cost mana, they all take swings. It takes them multiple turns to find their lethals, and usually by that time we've already done our swing turn. Maybe we hit a taunt if need be, but generally speaking we'll have to set up two turn lethal, so they can't just ignore your board and go face. So when it comes to things like the 1-3 and the 2-3, generally you should be leaving them up until your swing turn. Reason being is they're going to help you get your 10 drops down in the form of your Mogus and Sea Giants. It can be fine to play a board without Mogus and Sea Giants. Say, if the opponent hasn't got any minions on their side of the board, you can just develop. Particularly if you have multiple swings of your weapon left, or if you have just another refill on the next turn. That can be absolutely fine. I will say though, what you don't want to do is just develop a very narrow board. Narrow boards are how you lose. The thing with our deck is that if any of our board survives to the next turn, we get to snowball even harder because we get to evolve again, we get to more minions down onto the board. So if they can't fully clear one of our boards, we're just going to snowball into an un unclearable board state on the next turn. If your Derailed Coaster is your board flood card, it can be tempting to use the 1-1s to trade off the entirety of the opponent's board, but in doing so you're going to narrow your board and make yourself weaker to Blade Dance. There's something to keep in mind whether it's actually worth trading your 1-1s or just keeping your board state wide and leaving them with like a 1-3 or a 2-3. Sometimes even leaving them with things like Ilganoff or a 5-5 if the trades really aren't that great. Sometimes against Soul Demon Hunter you're not going to have the weapon in hand or you're going to have plenty of board floods available. In these situations you can sometimes do a bit of a trick with Desert Hairs. I only really recommend doing this if the opponent has no board whatsoever. If they have like a bunch of 1-3s and 2-3s, don't develop a Desert Hair into them because they're just going to get value traded. But sometimes when they don't have anything, you can just develop a Desert Hair onto the board, particularly into their turn 4 where they want to play the Marrow Slicer, and it puts them in a tough spot. Their Hero Power only deals with one of the Desert Hairs. Maybe they have a 2-mana removal spell to deal with another one, but that's going to cost them the majority of the turn, and it's going to slow down their game plan. But oftentimes what will happen is Desert has such a scary card that you simply playing three 1-1s is going to cause them to pay their three mana AoE, and they don't have infinite supply of them. They don't have infinite supply of soul fragments either. When dealing with Ilganoff, it is a scary minion, but oftentimes you won't have very clean trades into it, or your opponent also has some other board that you need to worry about. The thing with trading into Ilganoff, you really don't want to be trading like 1-1s into it, because each time you do a trade into it you take two damage really just evaluate whether it's worth trading at all a lot of times what i do is trade into the rest of their board take good trades where i can and just do an evolve sometimes you're going to be put in spots particularly this game we haven't seen the early footage but the opponent had the insane early cur curve of spirit jailer panthera marrow slicer plus five five which puts you under a lot of face pressure but that's not going to happen every game but again, you still want to make sure you stay wide on the board. Had we traded all our 1-1s away, we would have been incredibly susceptible to this blade dance. They ended up getting lucky anyway, and our, our evolves were pretty terrible in the first place. They, they managed to blade dance all our big minions away. The stats that we evolved into are bad. But the board state that we created was very awkward for their clears, and it meant that we weren't super, super far behind in tempo, even though they had the hand of Twin Slice... Blade Dance and Bladed Lady. Had we had stayed narrow, we would have been absolutely destroyed by that. I mean, sometimes RNG is just not on your side, right? In this game, we take Greed to the extreme, going very low on, on health just to make sure we get that swing turn that we need. Even getting oozed in the process, delaying our swing turn even further. Perhaps you could argue that we went a little bit too greedy this game, but the point is to emphasize is that you want to be creating these board states that are just super super hard for the opponent to clear 
This might be going a little bit too far. It was possible for us to go tour guide, hero power, vape Mogu and have a five minion board. Five minions with only two of them being tall and also leaving an opponent with some board left over is a recipe for disaster against things like Blade Dance, Bladed Lady. So I decided in a spot to go even greedier, just hoping to get the Sea Giant down as well. And it pays off in spades, as you're about to see. I do get a bit lucky because we hit a taunt. But when you get oozed in the game, sometimes you've got to take some chances. In any case, I've probably beaten it to death by now, but these, these are the board states that you want to be setting up. Okay, let's talk about Aggro Demon Hunter. Now, everyone tells me, Mr. Jambre, your deck only works at top legend where there's no Aggro Demon Hunters. At my rank, it's full of Aggro Demon Hunters, so I can't win. Your deck's trash at my rank. Uh, about half of the Demon Hunters I face, which is the most popular class I face, by the way, are Aggro Demon Hunters. The other half usually sold Demon Hunter. In fact, I think Aggro Demon Hunter is even slightly more popular, even at top 10 legend. I've, uh, I've heard other things like, oh, it's a low sample size, so you probably just got Lucky Evolves or something, or I know what their list is, but they don't know what my list is, so they don't know how to play around cards, which is really not true when you're a streamer who post decks on Twitter, or like saying that Aggro Demon Hunter is somehow misplaying, even though we're playing against top 50 Aggro Demon Hunters pretty much every single time. And also the deck's pretty easy to play. The fact of the matter is that the Evolve Shaman players are the one who's who are misplaying this matchup. The trick to this matchup really is that the weapon is not the way you win. But the majority of times that you win this matchup is going to be through Mogus and Sea Giants, Lightning Blooms, and Derailed Coasters. These are the cards that are like most effective in this matchup. In fact, I'd say that you don't even want to keep Boxbine Knuckles in the mulligan against a random Demon Hunter. Since in terms of mulligans, overall I've had actually a 66% win rate over nearly 30 games this season. Now, I don't think the matchup is that good. I think I certainly... I'm running slightly above average, but to say the matchup's super unwinnable and impossible is just far from the truth. There are a few things that you can do within the matchup that's going to help you, but the main thing is going to be through your mulligan and just trying to set up swing turns. Now the difference is that these swing turns do not come with evolve effects. They are simply getting down Mogus, getting down Sea Giants, rushing into your opponent's board, killing off the highest attack minions they have, and just simply overwhelming your opponents with stats then killing them before they can kill you. That's generally the game plan. Once you've done the swing turn, the weapon becomes a lot better at closing out the game. It's just not a card that you want to be doing early before you do your swing turn or like keeping in the mulligan because it's just too slow. You're going to take far too much face damage and your opponent's going to be too wide on board for your swing turn to be impactful enough. You're usually just going to be dead before you can really do it or when you do do it, you're going to die on the next turn. Now, Polkel is very popular in Aggro Demon Hunter right now. A lot of times you're going to see Polkel on 5 into Skull on 6 into Crazy Altruist on 7. Now, the best way to beat this is to just kill them. You need to make sure you're not dead to just whatever board they have. And usually what will happen is you'll have done your swing turn. By this point, they'll drop the Polkel Kel down maybe. And you'll be ahead on board. At this point, if you've got a weapon drawn, it's usually quite nice since probably create a board that's going to kill them on the next turn. But it's very important in, the, in this position to set up a two turn lethal. You really don't want to be in a spot where you actually have to deal with the outer swing turn. Sometimes you can do it if you haven't got enough damage but you've got a lot of health on board, particularly like a 10 drop or an evolved 10 drop. Really, the downside of them playing Polkel is that they kind of skip their next turn. They have to spend 6 whole mana on just drawing cards. Cards that aren't really playable or they don't want to play because they want to pop off with Altruist, right? So that means you have 2 turns of just being able to go full face and they, they can't really do too much about it. The only thing they can really do is when they skull on 6, sometimes they draw an outcast weapon. So you, your board will take a 1 damage AoE basically. If they're very lucky, they will hit double weapon and sometimes it takes two, but usually that's not something you should be playing around unless you absolutely can afford to do so. But just keep in mind that you don't really want things on one health if going into that turn, if you can. Don't take a value trade which puts, puts like multiple minions on one health instead. Just keep things healthy at two, that way they can push face again. 
saw in the example where I could have value traded my 10 drop, my 5 5, into their pole count and then evolved it afterwards. I decided not to because, because really it, it never threatened lethal on me. I, my life total was enough. It only gets one trade on board into a minion. Um, and that's never worth the five face damage. I always wanted to set up lethal, so I never had to deal with the altruist turn. Unfortunately, we got unlucky twice with our evolves. Uh, first hitting the five five the first time, and then hitting the five five again the second time. And that's going to happen sometimes. But for the most part, we just wanted to make sure we set up a two turn lethal. Most of the times, the four five is not going to be able to deal with our ten drop. Another thing that will help you in the matchup is target prioritization. Uh, the main offender of misplays here, I think is Voracious Reader. Many players are like, really want to clear the Voracious Reader because the Demon Hunter is going to draw more cards from it. Them drawing cards isn't really a problem. The matchup is so fast that there are two things that are going to happen. Either you're going to take over tempo from them and kill them, or they're going to get enough attack on board, get enough board control early, that they're going to kill you. Either side don't really run out of resources. It's not. It never comes down to a grindy matchup. So in terms of what targets you should kill, you absolutely should always go for the targets that are pressuring your face the most, or have the most attack that are pressuring your board control. You don't. There's no good evolving into a, like a five drop if you had weapon dread, dread corsair, and then you killed a voracious reader to stop their card draw, but you left a three two or something on board, and they have no problem cleaning up your board or just pushing face damage. It's all about tempo that that matchup really. If they play Voracious Reader, you should be pretty happy about it, because it's 2 mana for just a 1 attack creature. One card that can be particularly annoying for you is the 2 mana Taunt, the Brawler. Simply because a Mogu can't uh, value trade it, and it can't value trade anything behind it, because there's a Taunt in the way, obviously. And the Divine Shield is really annoying, it requires 2 attacks to get through. So if you don't have uh, a coaster, it's going to cause you a lot of problems. So if you have something like Innovate Weapon, and they've just played a brawler. It could be a good idea to take that thing out as quick as possible. Also keep in mind that it's not worth trying to go for early board control, particularly if you're on the coin. Things like Sludge Slurper and Tour Guide really aren't going to put a dent in Demon Hunter's board control. They get value traded by absolutely everything from the Demon Hunter side. They're weak to an outcast weapon from them. It really is best just to try to go for the main four cards, which are Coaster, Sea Giant, Mogu, and Lightning Bloom. If you have any of these cards in the mulligan, just always keep them. You don't need double Coaster, but keeping things like double Giant, double Mogu are incredibly powerful. If you're going first, I'd say you, you can keep the Custodian, but I wouldn't keep the weapon. If you're going second, unless your hand is incredibly good already, I'd recommend throwing away the Custodian, as crazy as that seems and just looking for the high roll cards. The weapon's not always unplayable. If you have Bloom Weapon, it can be fine. If you have Bloom Weapon Dread Dread, it's like an insane hand. But generally speaking, you should not be keeping it. Because the Demon Hunter is basically a bunch of one drops, they're pretty much forced to go wide on board. But they naturally just play into your Mogus and Sea Giants, and they really can't do anything to stop it if they want to keep developing ball and keep spending mana. In the very, very late game when you've got enough board, sometimes you want to just play around their face damage, so just dropping like a Dread Corsair and not evolving it, if you absolutely need a taunt, is potentially something that's going to secure your game. Okay, so why does it say the matchup is this bad on HS replay? Well, it really is, people are just miss mulliganing. We can have a look here at the mulligan guide against Demon Hunter. And look at the cap percentage Custodian. 97%, full guide 80%, star server 80%, bloom, this is a card you do want, but because we're keeping like stuff like Knuckles, Custodian and these one drops, the mulligan win rate of this is going down. This card's only really good because it's going to help you get your sea giants down a bit easier, but we see on like the cap percentage on the low end, sea giant, mogu are pretty low down there, so is coaster. Now, the mulligan win rate on these cards are not great, but that's because people are keeping cards that aren't great with them in the mulligan, or like they're playing these cards on turn 1, or turn 2 or whatever. So it means that a card like a Sea Giants is never going to come down 
because you haven't got anything to enable it. Going first, um, Custodian's like not too bad. It's not too bad going first, but on the coin, it drops off quite a bit. You could you could potentially keep it going first, but for the most part, you want to be just looking for those uh, those cards I've already mentioned. Also, we have like Cable Rat at a sixty percent keep against Demon Hunter, which is like insane to me. I feel like this card should not be kept in any matchup. It's pure like filler. If you already do have some Mogus and Sea Giants, you can consider keeping Desert Hair since it pretty much is just three one drops. Downside to it is it's kind of weak to weapon on the swing back. It's a bit worse than maybe like Stud Step or Tour Guide stuff. But you're getting three things instead of one. Also, if you've got Hair, Mogus, like Broomstick also becomes kind of nice as well. Island Hunter is another uh, aggressive deck that you can apply similar methods to beating as you do for Aggro Demon Hunter. Highland Hunter tends to be a bit slower, so the weapon stuff performs a bit better against Highland Hunter than it does against Agro Demon Hunter. Well, in general, on H3 play it's saying it's slightly unfavoured. I think this matchup is pretty favoured, to be honest, as long as you play it well. You want to be keeping Mogu's Sea Giant hands again like you are against Agro Demon Hunter. But things like Custodian going first are also still pretty strong. If we look at H3 plays Mulligan Guide against Hunter, there isn't a huge sample size. If we look at the cap percentage, Sodium, Slurper, Lightning Bloom, Tour Guide, Hawks by Knuckles all have very high keep percentages. But the swing turn card like Durrell Coaster, Mogu, Sea Giant, all fairly low. Which leads me to believe people aren't keeping hands with them in, inside them. Mogu Flesh Shaper is particularly good against Highlander Hunter since they do run a lot of one drops, a lot of early game. They tend to get ahead on board. But something like Mogu can swing the board back. They don't tend to run that many reactive plays. So something like a 3-4 rush, it tends to 2 for 1 or even 3 for 1, some of Hunter's minions. Or maybe you just get board control at that point and you can stick it around for an evolve later. And they just don't have the removal to take care of it. Going first is generally better than going second. You see Custodians a lot better going first. And on the coin, quite a drastic dis difference here, but the... The sample size is kind of small, but generally speaking, if you're going first against Highlander Hunter, you can keep things like Custodian, you can keep things like Clacker if you already have a tour guide, that sort of thing, and actually play for board control and try and get ahead, and that's going to serve you well. But if you're on the coin, you really want to be looking for swing turns like Sea Giant, Desert Hair, Broomstick, all these combos together as are how you get board control back. So in general, for Mulligan Tips, treated fairly similar to Agro Demon Hunter, but you can be a bit more lenient in keeping the weapon, particularly if you have a Dread Corsair to combo with it, is usually enough tempo against Highlander Hunter to get you ahead. So likewise with Agro Demon Hunter, Highlander Hunter runs Lawkeeper Polkelp, and when they do that, you know they're going to get a Bran in their hand. So how do we play around a Bran? Well, this deck tends to set up lethals pretty quickly, so if we're ahead on board, which we hopefully will be at this point, you want to be setting up lethals against your opponent. The thing with Bran is it costs their entire turn 7 to play it, and if you're not on 8 health on turn 7, or you have a taunt, well, it's going to have to be a Dino Trader Bran. So don't get caught up in constantly clearing your opponent's board or making sure you, you don't want to take any damage. Doing things like developing Dread Corsair without evolving it at, like uh, on turn 5 or so because you're wor worried you won't have a taunt for turn 7 and you're going to die. Just think about it rationally and say, as long as I'm on 9 health or more by turn 7, the brand can't kill me. So it's going to have to trade or they have to do a different play. And you know they're drawing things like the brands, so in terms of their plays, it's pretty limited. From the Hunter side, they would love to just play Bran on turn 7 and send it all to the face. But if you put them under enough pressure, they simply won't be able to do that play. A difference for Hunter compared to Agro Demon Hunter is that they run Zephyr. So just be a bit wary if they have a kept card that they haven't played for a few turns. It's potentially Zephyr, so you want to maybe not be super greedy with your swing turns with weapons because getting ooze potentially loses you the game. Obviously context dependent. Also with Hunter they run a bunch of secrets. They tend to run both Snake Trap and Pack Tactics. In general you don't want to be activating these unless you can deal with them. Delaying activating a Snake Trap can be particularly devastating for the Hunter because 
The instant board it makes plays right into Mogus and Sea Giants. If you activate it too early, they're, well, they're probably just going to trade off the snakes, and suddenly your swing turn's not looking quite so hot. Freezing Trap is also a scary secret sometimes, particularly if you've like evolved a, just a Dread Corsair. In general, this deck does pretty well around Freezing Trap since we run two Broomsticks, and we run two, two Coasters, and also two Mogu Flesh Apers, all of which are excellent responses into a Freezing Trap. If they do play a secret and you don't have those cards in hand and you just have a lone minion, pay attention to how they do some of their trades. If they just try to isolate your big minion instead of pushing face damage and playing a secret, well, it's pretty likely to be freezing. And in those cases, it might be better to just not attack at all with your big minion and just wait until you're able to play a rush guy to prop the freezing and then you don't have to waste all that mana on your 5 drop bouncing back to hand. Typically, I think the matchup against Hunter is good. It's better than the matchup against Aggro Demon Hunter, for sure. But again, a lot of the things that apply to Aggro Demon Hunter will also apply to the Aggro Islander Hunter matchup. For Rogue, it's generally quite a favoured matchup, particularly if the Rogue doesn't know what they're doing. Generally speaking, the Rogue usually only wins through an early questing or an early Edwin. Things like Miscreant or the 1-2-1 one, one Thief things aren't really game-winning plays. Or even Hanar itself is also not that great. The simple fact is that the the rogue cannot deal with the weapon. You don't need a huge weapon swing turn to beat a rogue. You, you just need like an okay one, and you, usually you'll just get ahead and win. The times where you lose is when they play an early questing, or they play an early, very large Edwin, and you can't deal with it, and they just smork you, and you die. Sometimes the rogue can have enough discovered damage through eviscerates and one thieves if their early board gets enough chip damage in, but their early board to put a lot of damage out usually has to involve an Edwin or a questing. Against Hanar, if you don't have a way to cleanly kill it that doesn't disrupt your game plan, just ignore it. Don't go out of your way to kill it like using Broom and all small stuff, it really doesn't do much. There really isn't any secret in the game that stops you from making a super wide board or puts you under that much face pressure. At the end of the day, Hanar is a 2 mana 1 attack minion, and if they want to get value out of the secrets, they have to spend all their future mana on playing secrets, right? So if they're doing that, they're not putting enough pressure out there on the board to really kill you. The Rogue has pretty much zero good AoEs, so once you're far enough ahead on board, they can't do anything about it. I know I know, Hana is a, is a kind of a scary card, but against this deck it really is not. It's not a great play. Whenever Rogues keep cards and then I see that they drop Hana, I'm always pretty happy that it's not a questing or an Edwin. Another card they can win through is Jandis. If they have Jandis plus Shadow Step, it creates quite a lot of board. The nice thing about Jandis is it's quite weak to Derailed Coaster, since you can pretty much always ping off the one health guy. And it also goes pretty wide on board, so it's very easy to get your Sea Giants and Mogus down. The problem is it just puts out a lot of attack pressure out there, and if you don't have a good clear for it, sometimes it puts a, too much face pressure on you and you end up dying to it. I'd say if you already have Weapon in hand, uh, broom is a pretty good keep. Basically the Broom just allows you to clear off the Questing or Edwin on your swing turn. It's not a card I would keep on its own if you don't already have the weapon. But again, like I said, if you're just ahead, you don't need a crazy weapon to beat a Rogue. Even a mediocre one usually wins you the game. All in all, Rogue is pretty favoured. Like Things like Blackjack Stunner can help them get a little bit back on board towards the end. So you want to try and make sure you're, you're wide on your swing turns and not go super all in on just having like a narrow board with two big minions in them. But usually it's not enough to get them back into the game. If they do stunner you and you have the option to kill the stunner versus killing like a one thief, uh, I would always prioritize the, the stunner pretty much always just because it's just a, high, a higher tempo card. A lot of rogues run ambush now, so you can sometimes consider when doing swing turn maths that they might generate an extra minion on board, and sometimes that allows you to do, it, to do your swing turn a little bit quicker. Next, let's talk about ETC OTK Warrior. Matchup is around 50-50 on HS Replay, and my stats also tend to agree with that analysis. Not much data for the Mulligan win rate, but generally speaking, uh, against Warrior, a lot of the time it is a case of a resource battle, Obviously you want to get the weapon, but a card like Horde Purger is very good in this matchup as well, since it's going to give you a lot of resources and make sure you don't really run out of weapon swings or run out of boards. Now with most matchups we've talked about and this guide in general so far, we've talked about setting up these huge swing turns that you know catapult you to a win. 
The thing is against Warrior because they have tempo resets in the form of barrels and brawl. Doing this is very likely to send you to an early loss a lot of the time if they have those cards. And generally speaking, people will keep one or, one or the two in the mulligan. So it's very unlikely that you dodge both of them if you go all in with an absolutely massive swing turn and just leave nothing back. In terms of removals from the Warrior, if you have too many minions around the same mana cost, a lot of the time they're going to be quite weak to Bladestorm, particularly if you don't develop anything else alongside that. Obviously, people know to play around Brawl, but to have a Brawlable board be killed by a Bladestorm instead of a Brawl is a huge loss for you. The thing with resources like Brawl, a lot of the Warriors are only running one of them right now, alongside a Barov. So once you get the Brawl out, a lot of the times it's very hard for the Warrior to clear your future boards. If you lose your board to a Bladestorm because you didn't want a Totem or you didn't want to play a 1-drop because you feel like that just makes you weaker to Brawl, then that's a potentially game-losing play. Sometimes if you're not sure, instead of evolving your Totem before, which is going to get you more stats, you can evolve your board, see if it's weak to Bladestorm and decide whether you want to add a Totem to it or not. Remember that if they have a weapon up, Sometimes it's going to help them with their Bladestorm clears in that they can kill off one of your low health minions and the Bladestorm is going to do a lot more work. So sometimes you need two one health minions or two low health minions, depending on the board state. Another card to think about is the Bulwark. Now the Bulwark is weaker to wide boards. Unfortunately, when you play wide boards, it makes you weaker to the AoEs. And in order to get wide boards, it means you're probably going to have to spend more of your resources. So in general, I wouldn't try to play around Bulwark too much unless you know that they have it in hand, or that they've used already some of, or that they've used already some of their AOEs like the Brawl or the Barov already. Then you need to start considering about the Bulwark. In general, you should consider it at least a little bit and try to have four minions on board most of the time. This means you're, you're usually not going to be overcommitting your resources, but you're also able to get through the Bulwark in usually one turn. Skipper Armorsmith turns are also very power powerful from the Warrior. The way to play around them really is to know that they do 3 damage to your board at most. They can sometimes do a bit more if they if they have a weapon or if they have a broomstick to rush their Armorsmiths in afterwards. But when trying to play around that, you need to plan ahead for the future. If they haven't brawled you or they haven't barreled you, and they still have Skipper Armorsmith as well, you need to manage the order of when, of how you create boards. You don't, want to, you don't want to commit Desert Hairs to a board where you already have you know, a 10 drop on it or a 5 drop or a 6 drop because that kind of board usually requires a Brawl or a Barov. The problem with like committing Desert Hair to that is that your next board that you're going to create is going to be likely through Coaster or through Pitmaster or just even two drops and one drops, those sort of things. And it's those sort of boards that are very weak to skipper armorsmith so if you commit all your high mana cost cards to the board that gets hit by a brawl or a barov and then your next board also gets cleared by skipper armorsmith it can be devastating instead if you hold back like the desert hair knowing that they're going to clear your first board but also knowing that your second board is likely a little bit safe from the skipper armorsmith combo it's very likely the warrior is going to play a sword eater on turn four so don't try to fight for board control early Playing things like Sludge Slurper early is fine though, because it's going to get a bunch of chip damage into face. And it might even help you clear up the Sword Eater later. Or at least do one damage to it so you can swing your weapon into it and kill it in one shot. But don't try to fight for board control too early, because the early game minions in general are just going to stop dead into a Sword Eater. The nice thing about sword, if you go behind against the Sword Eater is that it might help you with your swing turns. It is a 2-5, so it gets value traded by a Mogu, or at least value bumped and finished off, maybe by your weapon, or maybe by coaster minions. So if you can feel that you're about to fall behind to the warrior, to the 2-5, try to not contest too much instead. Just go for one of those swing turns that we use in other matchups with a coaster, and pot potentially a Mogu as well. But just be aware that you only want to commit enough that you pull far ahead. You don't want to overcommit and then just get brawled or whatever afterwards. In terms of the ETC combo, sometimes the warrior is forced to use part of the com parts of the combo to draw cards through like Battle Rage or to just help clear out some of your boards so they don't die. If they're missing parts of the combo, particularly Pen Flinger or both the Brooms or even ETC himself, you can sometimes switch up your game plan into 
outlasting the warrior. Once they lose their ETC combo, basically their win condition is through Ralgor. Some of them also run Zephyr, so beware of Tyrion or Pyroblast in that regard as well. But generally, if you can avoid taking face damage and running out of resources, you can actually just win through fatigue by answering the Ralgor. It's pretty hard to answer the Ralgor outside of Fireheart, but Fireheart can definitely do it. If you have Fireheart in hand, consider this as a route to victory. I have won this way a few times in the past. It's not very common that you can do it, but sometimes that you, you force the warrior into it, and if you find the answer to the Ralgor, they really just don't have enough threats to kill you. Just be wary about taking too much face damage, because you can sometimes die to a Zephyr if they're running that, or just from a late game tempo push if you're too low, or like Sword Eater Swords going face. The more you play the matchup, the more you get a feel for it. One thing I will say is that if you're expecting a Skipper Armorsmith Battle Rage turn or something like that upcoming, um, you can hold back your Mogu Flesh Shapers. Also, generally speaking, whenever you have a good board that's pushing good face damage, you just want to set up for the future, and that means usually holding back on a weapon swing and just making sure you have one for refill so you don't have to spend the mana on re-equipping the weapon again. Or just saving the weapon charge so that you don't run out of value long term and just keep pushing the damage with the board. When it comes to Fireheart, generally be quite greedy with her and just save her to the later turns. Do your other plays before before Fireheart. Vivid Spores is a potentially game winning option, so if you ever get offered that against Warrior, it's usually a good pick. Also a great way of putting out pressure without using weapon swings is to drop a sea giant. It really doesn't need to be evolved and the warrior still has to answer it. They cannot take 8 damage a turn from an AA, and it doesn't really die to AoEs, so unless they have a lot of armor for a shield slam, the thing's going to stick around. One thing I will emphasize is that you really want to put the warrior under pressure. If you don't have any pressure on, it's just going to allow the warrior to just use one of their turns to draw cards. They have plenty of card draw in their deck, but it costs mana to use. So if you just put out a board out there that doesn't have enough damage because you're worried about a brawl or something like that, the warrior's just going to use that turn to draw cards, and then they're, then they're even more likely to have a brawl for the future. Instead, if you put the pressure on quite quickly, obviously not overcommitting, then you're going to force the warrior into a spot to spend their mana on basically dealing with your board. Push face damage where you can. On the other hand, don't leave them with too many damage minions because Battle Rage is an incredibly powerful card. And usually you want to make them have to use a skipper if they want to use, utilize Battle Rage effectively. And if you give it for them for free just because you decided not to clear some of their minions, you're going to feel very bad when those skippers come down later on in the game. Also, sometimes if they do like a skipper turn to partially clear your board or, they, or clear your board and the skipper's left over, be a bit wary of leaving the skipper alive if you're about to do a big board development turn. Because if they have a barrel in hand, the skipper can just activate the barrel. There are a few sneaky things you can do against priests to improve the matchup a little bit. First thing I will say is that priests are generally quite a good matchup. As opposed to warrior, they don't have as much card draw, so they're not con going to consistently hit the things they need. They also, their AoEs are generally more expensive than warriors are. Soul Mirror is also not always that great because sometimes the boards you have aren't fully cleared by a soul mirror they may have more health than they have attack and if your board survives the soul mirror you can just evolve it again one thing i will say against priest is when it comes to sethic veil weaver do not lose your mind against it the card that really gets you is nasmani blood weaver the thing with sethic is even though they generate some spells a lot of the time the spells they generate are kind of useless and it costs them a lot of mana to even play them the difference with the Bloodweaver is that the Bloodweaver actually generates some tempo by reducing the cost of cards in their hand, and that is a lot more dangerous for you. The thing with them going in on a Sethic if they don't have a Bloodweaver is it actually almost helps you in a lot of waves. Sometimes, yeah, they get really lucky and they hit a Plague of Death and then it gets discounted, or they hit a Soul Mirror or something like that. Yes, sure, that can happen. You have to think that the there's always an opportunity cost in Hearthstone for using cards. They're basically swapping their targeted spells that they had in hand for new random spells. So if there's a card like Renew, it doesn't feel like it does that much if they change it for a random spell, but Renew is actually a pretty good combo with Wild Pyromancer later down the line. Also, cards like Apotheosis, you're pretty happy if they put it on their Veil Weaver to protect it, 
because again, that's going to take away from an incredibly strong wild pyromancer play down the line. It costs them quite a bit of mana to actually play the Apotheosis, so like if you have a huge board, honestly, unless you've got like a really juicy trade, or you've got Rush to kill, it, kill off their minion, like you can just maybe sometimes bait them into Apotheosising their guy, because they end up taking a bunch of face damage regardless. And then they just, they just don't have that crazy wild pyromancer heal to fall clear your board turn later on. In terms of playing around Solmer, um, obviously if you have a, a board with uh, more health than attack and they need a Solmer to get back and you're outputting a decent amount of damage that they're going to be dead in a couple turns, it can be a good idea not to evolve it. You don't need every minion to have more health than attack, but a good couple of them would be nice, especially if they're higher mana cost, because if you evolve them after a Solmer, you're just getting better stats, right? The Wave of Apathy, remember that your minions are going to go back to full attack once the wave's over, so you don't want to trade like everything off even though you can sometimes. But again, like Warrior, some of the matchup comes down to just resource battles some, some of the time. But against Priest, usually when you like snowball a big board, it can just outright win you the game and it's a lot harder for them to clear it. One way to play around Plague of Death is to just push face damage if your board's big enough. If you can get them into potential lethal range through weapon hits over a few turns, Plague of Death costs their entire turn, so they can't really heal in the process. So consider, again, with the Apotheosis point, point we are talking about before, whether or not you should actually be clearing some of their minions. One thing to do when playing around Solmer is put your highest cost minion on the far right. Sometimes there ends up being spots where they can't actually trade off a minion that they played onto board, but they want to Solmer. In that case, only six minions are summoned, and the, your far right minion is left safe. Not, you're not always going to be able to do that. If they can just kill off one of your guys with a trade, you're not really playing around Soul Mirror because they just trade and then Soul Mirror. But pay attention to things like Reborn. Like If they Reborn their Cobalt Spellkin or their Sethic, it could be a good idea to just leave it up, particularly the Sethic, if they need to Soul Mirror you anyway. Since the low attack on these creatures means that they probably can't kill off one of your guys, and if they try and suicide their guy, well, because they have Reborn, the board space just is always locked up. Same thing goes for Mind Flayer Karj. You can just ignore it some of the time and exploit its weakness with Soul Mirror. Also, when it comes to Cabal Wave, again, this is actually something that isn't too bad for you. Depends on your hand, I guess. The thing with Cabal Wave is it costs them a Wave of Apathy, which is a very powerful card in the late, late turns, particularly if they're trying to get to Plague of Death or things like that. It's pretty much inevitable that you're going to create a, a huge board eventually against a priest. The thing with Cabal Wave is it's actually not that bad for you, if it even if it even if it hits like a five drop or something like that on turn five. And the thing with when they do it, the two four itself dies to a weapon swing, or dies to Mogu plus a coaster minion, and the minion that they stole still has one attack. So if you have something like Broom or if you have Mogu that can get to it, that sort of thing. You can honestly just value trade it away a lot of the time. So, whereas for a lot of decks, you want to be like playing around some of these things like Apotheosis. You want to be playing around Wave of Apathy plus Gabol some of the time. You want to be clearing Sethex because they can get out of control. With this deck, you kind of want to take a different approach and just say that if they use their resources in this manner, it's taken away from like even more devastating effects that they could use them for. One way you can play around Wild Pyro a little bit is if you have like a few trades where you're like, I could put all my guys on 3 health or I could put 1 on 2 and 1 on 4. You probably want to put 1 on 2 and 1 on 4. That way they just need a little bit more to clear your board. Okay, that's it for the guide, guys. I hope you all enjoyed it. It was quite long, but we made it here to the end. If you have any more questions about the deck or other matchups, feel free to ask me about them in the comments here, or on Twitter, or on my Twitch channel. I'll be happy to respond to you. But otherwise, good luck playing the deck, and I hope this guide helped you out a bit. For now, bye!